Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Arghun ke emme is wajib ki arhoshi hustahir wanta Allah subhanahu wa taala ke mati veri hadratan hamd sanaya shukur denne wo. Ajman Nabiya Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ekleek faanu ke aluna ashabna salawata salama barka lebunge di dua kurun. Arghun menge lobeti dibhirajya ki baamadu khuda. جزیرا قومی نمو اس بین لقوامی قانون تکا ہمیا انصافا سلحیا ہم جہم اللہ بکرا مینی ون دیدائی گے ہیا دشگا فخر ور کمائی کو ثابت وفا و قومی دنیا گے امہا قوم تا شامل و می ایکوری دولت تہو گے حد دیا ہونا عام مدی ہو گے رئیس کم گے مقام دی بہی رئیت کا لبن کمی راجے گے عزت رئیس الجمہوریہ Ibrahim Muhammad Salih ke hardana khaarji siyastu ke natija. Duniya ke qawm tahu ke itbara yagin kang miyadu dibahi rayyutun hoda fawa kam ke furi hama heki. Mi vayetu ya diya enga haru ba laqwa mi varugad ki illa ke emme uskurnu ka vihur vayamun diyayi fessa rata huda ki fenumun dibahi salaan kuramu migenda fahur vayri qawmi dida. دیوی رایتون گفراتون، آلوگون دالیف داله گنس دینی، امیه دوگه ریاسته. دنیای قوم تن اینگا دکون کیامون گذنی، دیوی راجه میگن امیه دوگه سیرون، امیه دو، افت دافیه مولی دهها شرمزون، یرو ایگه شواب، ایونه بونیا دو سیرون، دیر واشه هاییرا هندونا ریت مثالون. میستر سکرتری جنرال، اکسلنسیز، لیریس و جنتلمن، ای استن بیفور یو تودی. speaking to you for one final time as the President of the General Assembly. And while I have generally spoken for about seven minutes on average from this podium, I apologize that this one might be a tad bit longer. We started this journey a year ago promising a presidency of hope that delivers for the people, for the planet, and for prosperity. Today, my friends, we complete that journey, a journey of unprecedented challenges and triumphs, a journey of twists and turns, but also of laughter and friendship, a journey of renewed hope, a journey we would not have been able to make without the support, the friendship, and the guidance of all member states. I thank you, dear ambassadors. You made me feel like part of the family from day one. Despite the difficulties and the difficult times we have endured, you have celebrated many occasions over the past year. We celebrated unity, camaraderie, and hope together as a family. Excellencies, the Charter of the United Nations has always guided my work. Its first three words, we the peoples, my inspiration. The people of the world do not differentiate between the charter bodies, the funds and the programs and specialized agencies. For them, we all represent the one United Nations, and which is why I truly appreciate the close working relationship I had with the leadership of the charter bodies over this past year. Mr. Secretary General, it has truly been a pleasure and an honor to work with you. I have greatly benefited from your incredible experience and extraordinary friendship. Six days ago, we had our last coordination meeting. I'm saddened that that was the last of our year-long meetings and interactions. Through those meetings, I came to appreciate the statesman extraordinary that you are. But I also came to know a realist, a pragmatist, a diplomat, and a silent negotiator who cares beyond measure a person with a great sense of humor, a true friend. Thank you, my dear Antonio. Madam Deputy Secretary General, my dear sister Amina, I remain in awe of your strength, compassion, and commitment. I've greatly valued your wise counsel and your kind friendship. Thank you, my dear Amina. My dear friend, Colin Calapile, President of the Economic and Social Council at its 2022 session. 
Working together, we managed to further enhance the coordination between ECOSOC and the General Assembly and deliver several joint initiatives. I thank you, dear friend Colin. To the various presidents of the Security Council, thank you for the close working relationship you maintained with the General Assembly. Our monthly coordination meetings were invaluable opportunities to remain updated on the issues that the Council was seized of. My deepest gratitude to all my Vice Presidents for being part of my team in delivering my Presidency of Hope. Despite the pandemic forcing us to work in hybrid fashion, I'm incredibly proud that we finished the work of the regular part of the session on time, including adopting the budget. This would not have been possible without the steadfast leadership and commitment of the committee chairs and their respective bureaus. And as a gender champion, I'm especially proud that we celebrated the first all-female bureau of a main committee during this session. Congratulations, Ambassador Vanessa. The second committee has made history. I'm also indebted to the support extended to my presidency by the various programs and funds and specialized agencies. Together, we delivered on several mandates. Excellencies, a presidency is not just the person you see here at the rostrum. It is made up of several often unsung heroes. I thank Under Secretary General Moses Abelian and his team, Ruth, Kenji, and all of you for having my back. Whether it's meetings or documents management, interpretation, translation, or editing protocol or intergovernmental meeting support, the team at DGSCM has never let me down. Over the last year, Excellencies, I delivered 325 statements, many of them pre-recorded. My special thanks to everyone at the Department of Global Communications and the team at the recording studio. I still cannot forget the day we managed to record 13 statements at one go. My heartfelt appreciation to Andre, Duane, and Kathleen, and other officers from the United Nations Department of Security and Safety attached to my office. Thank you for your dedication and your professionalism. Thank you also to my chauffeurs pool, Dermont, Robert, Jimmy, and Evangeline. Rain, hail, or snow, you ensured that I made it on time, every time. The Secretariat is truly the backbone of this organization. Without the support of the various departments, I would not have been able to deliver. I thank each and every one of you for your contribution. <laughs> Excellencies, I promised a presidency of hope, built on five rays of hope recovering from COVID-19, rebuilding sustainably, responding to the needs of the planet, respecting the rights of all, and revitalizing the United Nations. And every day for the past 365 days, my team and I work to deliver on this vision. We convened 103 formal plenary meetings and adopted 307 resolutions and 140 decisions. We held 15 high-level meetings and a further 28 informal plenary meetings, hearings, thematic debates, and other events. This included important discussions on vaccine equity, on sustainable recovery of the tourism sector, the first time that tourism was ever discussed at a high-level meeting of the General Assembly. This included a moment for nature, which for the first time looked at the cross-cutting bottlenecks and solutions across the entire climate and environment agenda. We held the first International Migration Review Forum, where we adopted the Progress Declaration by consensus. We convened the first commemoration of the International Day for Countering Hate Speech. We held events on the urban agenda, on food security, on climate change, on commodities, on road safety, on Africa. Issues of critical importance for recovering sustainably and achieving the 2030 agenda. Fifteen mandated intergovernmental negotiations processes took place, for which 27 co-facilitators or co-chairs were appointed. I thank all the facilitators and their experts for the exceptional work 
that they delivered on my behalf. We began the process of finalizing the much-needed multidimensional vulnerability index for small island developing states. I wish to thank Minister Prime Minister Brown of Antigua and Barbuda and former Prime Minister Solberg of Norway for accepting my request to lead this charge. We agreed on ways to finance peace-building efforts. I held over 650 meetings here in New York and during my travels to gather ideas to ensure wider consultation and enhance coordination. We opened up the General Assembly for in-person participation of civil society for the first time after the pandemic. I continued the practice of morning dialogues, or holwashi, as I called it. For the first time, we held a morning dialogue at the level of experts focusing on women in diplomacy. This meeting became the springboard for the landmark resolution celebrating an International Day on Women in Diplomacy, an initiative I'm incredibly proud of. The morning dialogue on accessibility galvanized greater advocacy and awareness, including a workshop to delegates and secretariat. We witnessed the substantive role and moral authority of the General Assembly grow. We held an emergency special session on the General Assembly for the first time in 40 years on the request of the Security Council to address the conflict in Ukraine. The landmark resolution on veto initiative mandated a formal meeting of the General Assembly every time a veto was cast in the Security Council to debate the merits of that decision. We also managed consensus on the outcome document of the trafficking in persons meeting, the review of the functioning of the re-immigrated resident coordinator system, and the Oceans Conference declaration. Despite difficult times, we came together on issues of importance. A noteworthy example Excellencies, was the finalization of the political declaration on road safety. Going forward, I'm confident that we can come together on all issues as well. Excellencies, dear friends, often the United Nations is criticized for its shortcomings and its inadequacies. Rarely are our wins celebrated. This needs a course correction. At the same time, we must acknowledge that there are many things we can do better. I truly believe that our Common Agenda report sets us in the right direction. At the beginning of the year, you entrusted me with following up on the recommendations of that report. It was a responsibility I took to heart. After five intense rounds of thematic consultations that included more than 350 statements, 10 interactive multi-stakeholder panels, and over 50 panelists. I'm proud that we came out successful. I take this moment to thank the vice presidents who chaired these sessions on my behalf. And I'm so very proud that within a record time, we adopted the resolutions on establishing the youth office and the modalities of the summit of the future. Congratulations to all of you. These are the first important milestones towards realizing a United Nations 2.0. Excellencies, dear friends, during this session we ensured that the gender equality agenda was mainstreamed into all our discussions. I reconvened and upgraded and expanded the advisory board on gender equality. We made the United Nations more family friendly by renovating and expanding lactation rooms. We brought together female heads of state and government during the high-level week, held a focused discussion on violence against women in politics during CSW week, and a special event on shaping economies that work for women during Stockholm Plus 50. We also launched the UNGA platform of women leaders in partnership with, with UN Women, institutionalizing for the very first time in UN history the hosting of a dedicated meeting of female heads of state and government every year during the high-level week. I kept my promise to not participate in panels that were not gender balanced. I kept my promise to make my office gender balanced. 55% of staff are women. I, I 
I started a podcast series that amplified the voices of women doing extraordinary work. I met incredible and accomplished women, from victims to activists, from scientists to Nobel laureates, and I worked to support their work and elevate their message. Women should not have to work twice as hard just to prove a point. And Excellency, while we are on this topic of gender equality, I reiterate my earlier call. Let us ensure that the next Secretary General of the United Nations is a woman. <laughs> Excellencies, there are 1.8 billion young people around the world today, and we cannot ignore them. I truly believe that investment in the youth is an investment in multilateralism, which is why, during my presidency, I launched the PGA Fellowship for Hope. Eight young diplomats from underrepresented countries had the opportunity to work with my office and their missions. Armed with new wisdom and experience, I'm confident that these fellows and future young fellows will work to advance their countries and uphold the values of multilateralism. I take this opportunity to thank all the governments that supported the program. We are also indebted to UNITA for their support. Today, I've also placed in my office the Voices of Youth Time Capsule, carrying the voices of young people from around the world, describing their aspirations for 2045 when the United Nations turns 100. The time capsule will remain as a constant reminder of the importance of youth participation and their aspirations. My advice to young people around the world has always been the same. Stay determined, stay engaged, and stay hopeful. This is also my advice to women, CSOs, internally displaced persons, refugees, indigenous groups, and academia. In all my travels, largely to countries where PGS have never visited before, I made it a point to meet with these communities to enrich the discussions we have here in New York, to see firsthand how our deliberations here, the resolutions we pass and the budgets we allocate get translated into action. And my dear friends, they are. Our actions within these august halls of the United Nations are impacting lives. I applaud the UN country teams around the world for their work on the ground for making a difference. Dear friends, there are many untold success stories of the United Nations' work around the world. We need to bring these here to New York and bring the United Nations closer to the people it is designed to serve. For a more effective and a more responsive United Nations, this needs to happen. Excellencies, dear friends, none of this would have been possible without my team at the OPGA. My team of 73 came from 49 countries representing all the regions of the world. We drew strength from this diversity. My team is the largest to date in the history of the United Nations General Assembly. I thank all the member states, UN departments, and international organizations that seconded staff and provided funds for the office. The team was very ably led by my chef de cabinet, Ambassador Nagraj Naidu Kakanur a truly outstanding diplomat, a steady hand in crisis, committed and hardworking. I also thank the Deputy Chef of the Cabinet, Sada Hassan, Fernando Marani, and Midfa Naim. They are simply three of the most hardworking people I have ever come across, and always ready for a challenge. Together, we endured triumphs and setbacks. We not only mourned the loss of a very dear colleague and friend, Gail, but also welcomed the arrival of little Mariam, born to my advisor, al Haj and his wife, Abaydi. I'm incredibly proud of everything OPGA my team has achieved during this year. And I thank all of them wholeheartedly. I would be remiss if I don't thank the Maldivian government for seconding some of its best staff to my team. I would like to take to make special mention of my executive secretary, Ahid Ahmad, who has been by my side throughout the session, and my executive assistant, Salman Zaki, who managed my unenviable calendar and made sure that my work there never ended. 
Let us give a great round of applause to my team at OPGA. <laughs> Excellencies, this presidency has been a win like no other for my country, the Maldives, and the Maldives Foreign Service. I thank President Ibrahim Ahmed Saleh for trusting me with this responsibility. This is a win for your forward-looking foreign policy and your commitment to multilateralism, Mr. President. My team at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has shown the world what a small team of highly determined and committed individuals who refuse to give up hope can achieve. The team at headquarters and missions around the world under the incredible leadership and guidance of Minister of State Ahmed Khalil, with the support of the Maldivian ambassadors around the world, continues to work hard day and night with one objective in mind, to raise the Maldivian flag high. This is especially true of Team Maldives here in New York, led by the very excellent permanent representative and special envoy to the PGA, Tilmiza Hussain. I have one word for Team Khadiji, Kuravij. I'm also especially honored that special envoy of President Saleh, one of my mentors, His Excellency Ibrahim Hussein Zaki, is here with us today. I would also like to thank my family who made me the person I am today, especially my mom and dad. A special thanks as well to all my friends around the world and in the Maldives. Excellencies, even as we open our borders and return to our normal routines, COVID-19 stubbornly lingers. New conflicts are emerging and old ones persist. Millions across the world are starving and impoverished. A fragile global economy and disrupted food supply chains add to their burdens and anxieties. We are facing a climate emergency. The politics of hate continues to di divide us as we are in desperate need of unity. Migrants, women, Minorities and other marginalized communities look on in despair as their hard-won rights are stripped away. The multilateral system itself is under assault. Every crisis feels worse than the last. But my friends, the real crisis would be a loss of hope. Hope is not blind optimism or blissful ignorance. Hope is acknowledging and affirming our potential. It is about recognizing the wonders humanity is capable of when we are at our best and working together. If we can produce and distribute multiple viable COVID-19 vaccines in record time, can we not get everyone vaccinated, repair global supply chains and feed our hungry? If we can launch super telescopes capable of peering into the furthest edges of space and studying distant galaxies, can we not reverse the damage we have done to our own planet? If within a quarter century we can make quantum leaps in technology and transform the way we work and communicate, can we not revive and rebuild our economies to be sustainable? If we can avert a third world war and sustain the current multilateral system for 76 years, can we not amend the United Nations system where it falls short? Can we not silence the guns and conflicts and secure a true and lasting global peace? Of course we can, and it will take hope. Excellencies, let's not lose hope and give in to cynicism. Let us not turn our backs on those who look to us at the United Nations for solutions. Let us use this instrument at our disposal to secure global peace and justice. Let us not stand idle and let the world drift into an uncertain future. Let us tell the next generation that their aspirations, their future, their planet are worth fighting for. We owe it to ourselves, to our peers, to our children, to our grandchildren, and to humanity to choose hope. Excellency President-elect Chaba Koroshi, I congratulate you and wish you and your team the very best as you take on the responsibility of leading the 77th session. 
Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, dear friends, today the 76th session of the General Assembly ends, but hope must live on. It is true that humanity faces challenges more complex and multidimensional than ever before. Solving them will take ambition and perseverance, but, by guided, but guided by our faith in humanity, by our aspirations for a brighter future, by our love for our children and grandchildren, we will succeed with courage, with grace, with hope. We will succeed. Wama tawfiqi illa billahi alayhi tawakkaltu wa ilayhi unib. Thank you. Thank you.